floor, do quickly. There's not much time left. We don't have years, I don't believe. We may have a few months. But I don't think it's years. Uh, I know everybody wants uh, change in the White House. We're probably ain't gonna see that. The next change we see from here to there. <laughs> and that'll be all right with me. Is that all right with you? Amen. Yeah, amen. If you're saved, it is. <clears throat> now, for those that get nervous when I talk like that, you might want to check your salvation because a lot of Christians, you know, so called, they get uh get nervous. I'm like, well, I I got so much I want to do. I well, what do you mean, preacher? Oh, well, I, I'm not ready to go yet. You know, well, you better get ready to go. Because the Lord's getting ready to return. If you're ready to go, then you aren't going. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Matthew chapter 26. We're still talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. We're picking back up where we left off. Uh, we made a pit stop last week on tithing, and this week we're going to go back on subject. Matthew 26, 28. Actually, we're going to go back to verse 26. Very familiar verse. We read it every Sunday evening during communion service. And I'll break some things down to you here. I'm going to look at verse 26 first. I'm going to give you some spiritual application. Every verse in the Bible has some doctrinal applications. And they have a spiritual application, devotional application, and they have a prophetic application. Verse 26, I'm going to break it down to you. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. The Bible says he blessed it and broke it, break it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. That bread there, you could say spiritually, represents the word of God. And when Jesus took that bread, he broke it. He gave you two testaments. Old Testament, New Testament. That's what you have when you break something. It's two pieces, right? You got two pieces when you have a holy Bible. You've got the Old Testament. You've got the New Testament. Now, you are not going to be able to survive just with the New Testament. You've got to have the Old Testament, too, because the Old Testament explains the New Testament and the New Testament gives you the understanding of the Old Testament. You got to have both to have a completed Bible. You can't just have a New Testament. A lot of people, they say, well, I just read the New Testament, preacher. Well, you're missing out on a lot of stuff if you just read the New Testament. A lot of what the Bible says about Jesus Christ is found not in the New Testament, it's found in the Old Testament. If you want to know what Jesus Christ is going to do at the second advent, you got to go to the Old Testament because he speaks more about the second coming of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament than any other subject in the Bible. That's a fact. So he broke it. The Bible then says he gave it to the disciples. Now, i got some preachers in the room here uh, telling you that when you got a Bible, you're to give it to the disciples. You're to feed them the Word of God. Jesus Christ told the devil, he said, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word, every word, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That shall I live by. You're not just going to be good just getting a little dose on Sunday morning. you got to have some time with the Lord during the week and spend time in the book on your own and let God show you some things out of the Holy Scriptures. We need to get back to a place where we call this thing what it is. Preacher, i got a Bible. No, you actually got a Holy Bible. That's what you've got. You've got the Holy Scriptures. This book is holy. I wish people would stop downgrading this book and lift it up like it truly is. It's holy, it's undefiled, it's pure, it's spotless, it's just like Jesus Christ. And when you give people the Word of God, you're giving them the body of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, did you hear what I just said? I said, when you give them this Bible, the Holy Bible, this holy book, you're giving them the body of Jesus Christ. This is the body that is broken for you. He broke it at Calvary. He gave you a New Testament, an Old Testament. Before Jesus spoke that, you were in the Old Testament. Before Jesus shed his blood, everything before Matthew 26, 
is Old Testament. The Bible says here, he said, take, eat, this is my body. So when we do the communion service, you need to remember that when you're taking that bread, what it represents. That's why in the communion service we say, what it represents. That piece of bread in that cup there is not Jesus Christ. But what it represents is, see what I mean? When you give them this, you're giving them the body. When we take communion, we're saying, think about this when you do this. The Bible says, and he took the cup. I'm going to tell you, there's a cup that's being offered. There's two cups. There's the cup of salvation that the Lord offers to everybody that's on the face of this earth today. It's a cup that you have the opportunity to drink out of if you want it. But you got to want it. If you don't want it, the cup will pass you by and the Lord will present a second cup to you. It's the cup of God's wrath. But you're going to drink one of those two cups. Make no mistake about it. So I, only, I just choose not to drink either one. You don't have that choice. You're either going to drink the cup that God gives you that brings eternal life, or you're going to drink the cup, the cup that God gives you that brings eternal damnation. You're going to drink. Now, I think I'll take the cup of salvation. Because I've seen what the Bible says is going to happen to those that drink the cup of God's wrath. And it's not pretty. Take your Bible and go to Revelation chapter 6. I think it's Revelation 6. Toward the end. That verse there in verse, um, we're going to go down here to verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw on the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now that is the martyrs of Jesus Christ. Those martyrs are being killed, beheaded, and are under an altar in heaven. Now you can show that to your soul sleep people. Those that believe you sleep when you die. What's going on here when this soul, which is in heaven, under an altar in heaven, is talking? Don't sound like he's sleeping to me. Sounds like he's conscious and talking. The Bible says here, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and moon became as blood. That's Matthew 24 and Acts chapter 2. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely fruit, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island was moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. See, the Bible already knew that they were going to develop technology where they have underground bunkers, that they could try to hide from the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says that when they go to hide, I'm going to find them. And when I get them, I'm going to destroy them. There's no place to hide. The Bible says, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. For the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? Now I want to show you this cup for a minute. This cup is found in Revelation chapter, let's see, 6, let's to her. Revelation 16, 19. 
Go over chapter 16, verse 19. Verse 19, the Bible says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Well, there goes New York City, there goes Los Angeles, there goes uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, there goes uh, Washington, D.C., all of them. The Bible says, The cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there fell upon the men a great hail out of heaven uh, every stone above the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail and for the plague thereof was exceeding great they didn't repent they just got worse you say What's, what, what, why would they not turn to the Lord when this is going on. I'll tell you why. Because they're not regenerated by the blood of Jesus Christ. When a man's not saved, you don't know what that man will do. I hear people all the time when they're watching these ID channel programs and say, I would never do that. You don't know what you would do if you're not saved. When the devil gets inside of a man, he'll do anything. You better stay in the will of God because the devil will start testing your words. I'd never do that. Oh, yeah? Let God turn the devil loose on you for a little while and see what you'll do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Psalm 75. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over my children every day. I plead the blood, and I tell you, I see it work. My son, back here in the corner back here, he got in an accident this week, It could uh, this previous week. It could have been really bad. He could have got killed. But I know that wherever that blood goes, God's protection goes. Amen. Yeah. And there's no place too far. There's no place too deep. There's no place too wide that that blood of Jesus Christ cannot reach that person and put a wall of protection around them. I plead the blood of Jesus over my children. I ask God to be with them and protect them. Even those outside the ark of safety, I pray God's blood. I plead the blood over them and I pray God's protection to be on them and His mercy will be with them until they get their hearts right with Jesus Christ. If you don't pray that over your children, shame on you. You ought to. There's a lot of devils out here looking to get your youngins. Amen. And all of them ain't in the bars. That's right. All of them ain't in the nightclubs. <laughs> a lot of them are in the schoolhouse with the teachers and educators. Psalm 75. Look at verse 8. The Bible says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture. He poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof. Look at the next part. All the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. No exceptions. These blasphemers are going to drink. These mockers are going to drink. The fornicators are going to drink. The adulterers are going to drink. The whoremongers are going to drink. The homosexuals are going to drink. Everybody's going to drink of that cup if they don't go to the cup of salvation. Let's go back to Matthew 26. It's a cup. 
Thank God the Lord Jesus Christ instituted the, the Lord's Supper and offered a second cup. He said, you do this in remembrance of me. All right, we're going down here to verse um, 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, Drink ye all of it. Don't you leave anything there undrunk. Drink all of it. A little dab won't do you. The whole thing's got to be drunk, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. A little scripture verse a day. I got my little, I, I, I worked at a place one time, this lady used to come to me, she said, I got my little memory verse. <laughs> Sister, if that's all you're living on, you're in trouble. Amen. I guess it's a start for some people, but you know, you got to mature after a while somewhere along the way. I mean, you can't wear diapers all of your life, can you? <laughs> I mean, you got to mature somewhere and get potty trained, lady. It depends. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I have to remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you got to grow up. Christian, if there's one thing I want to get in your heart and in your mind when you leave this church every Sunday is I need to put my nose in the book. I need to know that book for myself. I need to know the scriptures. You may not know them just like the preacher knows them, and that's okay, but you need to know something in there. You need to spend some time with the Lord every day. Look at the next part. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for, uh-oh, not all. I said not all. That's a misnomer. You know, when I was in some of the other churches and we did communion service, I noticed something very apparently wrong with the communion service itself. Brother Chuck, in a lot of the communion services I've been a part of in, in past time, I noticed that when you do the words of consecration, they change that word many to all. Because they want to not offend anybody. They want to make everybody feel comfortable. Let me tell you something. If you're going to believe the Bible, there's some things in there uncomfortable. And if you're going to be a Bible-believing preacher or Christian that's going out proclaiming the Word of God, you're going to have to say some uncomfortable things sometimes. <clears throat> and this uncomfortable thing that we need to get a hold of today is, you ready? Jesus Christ did not die for everybody. Boy, that's strong. So where are you getting that from, preacher? I get that from my Bible. <laughs> it says many, don't it? Does it say all? Nope. Let me ask you something. You think Jesus Christ died for Judas Iscariot? No. No. He died. Did you know that Judas Iscariot, when he went out and betrayed Jesus Christ, the Bible says he he wept. He had a a spirit of repentance, but it wasn't heard from God. Jesus Christ had already made a pronouncement over Judas Iscariot and said, it's better that that man had never been born. So at the Last Supper, when Jesus is giving the cup and he's giving the bread, he said, this isn't for everybody. This is for a few chosen people that will obey me and do what I told them to do and receive what I told them to receive in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. And if you're outside of that, it's not for you. Jesus didn't die for everybody. He didn't die for the Old Testament people that died and went to hell. He didn't die for any of them. If he had, they'd have got out of hell. If he had died for everybody, Judas was scared when he went out and repented. The Bible says he would have got saved. Yeah. But he didn't. He's in hell today. He'll come up during the tribulation period as the Antichrist. 
and he'll be full of wrath. You know why? Because he knows he'll, no matter what he does, no matter what he says, no matter how he acts, no matter what he proclaims, he'll never be able to get to the third heaven. Now you let that sink in for a minute. Can you imagine being in a situation like that? Where no matter how you pray, no matter what you say, no matter how many times you cry, you can't get saved? I'll give you an example. Go to John chapter 2. Borderline, but not quite. I don't believe God has chosen people to be saved before the foundation of the world. I don't believe that God selects out certain people to be saved and others to be lost. I believe that based on their decisions and what they are doing will determine whether they go where they go when they die. But that being said, there are some scriptures that Calvinists will use to try to blanket, make a blanket statement with everybody when it applies to a certain few. Judas Iscariot could not be saved. The Bible says he was a devil from the beginning. He did not have a soul. A soulless person cannot be saved. Do you think the giants that were produced as a result of the sons of God coming down to the daughters of men could be saved? No. No. Why not? There you go. Judas is scared. His father was the devil. He didn't have a natural childbirth like you and I. When he comes up in the tribulation period, he's going to come up with wrath. And he's going after the one thing that God says is the apple of his eye, and that's Israel. And he's going to destroy the, he's going to beat the living tar out of them and try to destroy them. You know what Russia's saying right now? Anybody been paying attention? They got their sights on Jews. They got their sights on Israel. They got to get the Ukraine first. A Russian bear is coming down from the north. See? John chapter 2. Let's see. I think it's chapter 2. Let's see. Let me look here. Nope. It's not chapter 2. Hold on a minute. Give me just a second here. I'm going to find it real quick so I don't have y'all don't have to wait for me. I'm looking for that verse over there in John where it says, uh, they would not believe. It's in chapter, it's in John somewhere. Give me just a second, because this one in my notes. There we go. It's um, John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I missed it. John chapter 12. Alright, look over here at verse 34. The Bible says the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. How sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said to them, Yet a little while is light, is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. I cannot emphasize that enough. These charismatics, Pentecostals that run around, emphasize miracles, emphasize healing, emphasize all these miracle crusades, Yet, no matter how many of those churches spring up in a, church, in, a, in a community, no matter how many of those churches spring up in a nation, and they're all around the world, and it's the fastest growing 
Christian movement in the world right now, if you want to call it Christian. And it is a testament to what Jesus Christ said here. It doesn't matter how many miracles you supposedly perform, how many miracles you supposedly use, they still won't believe on Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's a heart condition. And the heart has to be changed first. And the only way that heart can be changed is preaching the gospel, not miracles. The Bible says here that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed thy report? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, now look at this. Look at verse 39. They could not believe. It did not say they would not believe. It said they could not believe. Church, I'm here to tell you today, it did not say they did not go to church. It said they could not believe. It did not say they didn't read their Bibles. It said they could not believe. It did not say that they didn't keep the Ten Commandments and get baptized and shake the preacher's hand and do all the religiosity things that people do in America today. It said they could not believe. Why? Because the previous verses said they rejected Jesus Christ outright. And there's a coming a time, folks, that if you reject the Lord and you keep rejecting Him, there'll come a time when He draws a line in the sand and He rejects you. And no matter what you do after that, you can't come to Him. And that's dangerous. That's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to be when you try to reach out to the Lord and He refuses you. It's a dangerous place to be when you try to get a hold of God and He's nowhere to be found. Saul got in that situation. He kept trying to find the Lord after he rejected the Lord and rejected the word of the Lord and rejected the word of the Lord. And finally the Bible says that Samuel came to him and says the Lord has rejected you, Saul. He's rejected you and he will no longer hear your prayers. Bible says that Saul went out and wept bitterly and he tried to find God. He tried to find God in every avenue that he could think of and he finally went to the witch of Endor. He resulted to going to witchcraft to try to find God. Isn't that America today? Yeah. Isn't that the America that we live in today where they've rejected God and rejected God and rejected God and now they are going to witchcraft to try to find God? And that stuff is getting inside the churches. They've got spiritual reading cards now that they have set up in these charismatic churches where they will read your prophecies. Just a fancy way of saying, I'm going to tell your fortune. These people that run around and look for a word from the Lord. Give me a word today, preacher. What you're saying is, you're a soothsaying seeker. God's give you his word and you rejected it. They could not believe. The Bible says, because the Isaiah the prophet said again, he, who's the he there? Who's the one that blinded them? He had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. I have had situations in my ministry where I have been dealing with people and I've been praying for people and they rejected and rejected and rejected and the Lord put in my spirit, don't you ever pray for that person again. Mm. And I weep and I cry for them. Stop crying. And they soon die. God's rejected them. No more. <laughs> There's a, line, there's a line in the sand God draws. God help us not to get there. Pharaoh got into that situation. The Bible says he hardened his heart against the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He repented. <laughs> yeah. 
He used all the right words. I repent this time. He even confessed his sins. He says, I confess my sin. I let him go. Yet he drowned in the Red Sea. The same Red Sea that saved the children of Israel is the same Red Sea that condemned Pharaoh and his armies. The same red blood of Jesus Christ that saves a man that comes to the cross uh, with a broken heart and a contrite spirit is the same blood that will condemn a man to hell that rejects him. It's the blood that makes the difference. And whether a man's saved or whether a man's lost, God said, I hated Esau, but I love Jacob. I never want to get to a place where God says he hates me. Amen. 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 Do you? No. He said, I hate him. How about Ephraim? God told the uh, prophet when he was praying for Ephraim, God told him, he said, don't you pray for him. Leave him alone. He's joined to his idols. Let him alone. Let him go his own way. Let him die lost. You pray for him, I won't hear you. It's crazy. It's scary. You got situations in your Bible that are hard to talk about but must be emphasized because we live in a church world today that believes that everybody's going to be saved, nobody's going to be lost, and God just loves everybody, and everybody is, makes God give you these big, big bubbly feelings and stuff. It's not that way, folks. We serve a holy God that demands holiness from those that live and serve Him. You approach God on His terms, not yours. Amen. It's non-negotiable. It's not up for vote or discussion. It is what He said, where He said it, and the way He said it. And when we come to God, I've, I say this so many times when I'm talking to people out there, when I'm knocking on doors, and I'm sharing the gospel with people and my coworkers, I tell them, plain and simple, God is not responsible to give you the gospel but one time. And once he's told you one time, he does not have to give it to you ever again. You are responsible for hearing it one time. And once you've heard it, you've heard it. Now, he may send it to you more than one time. He may give it to you a few times. He may send people along the way to try to get you in. But there are times when God has done something and he's done it one time. And he said, all right, you reject it, that's it. Adios, amigos. <laughs> Off to the lake you go. <laughs> Jesus Christ said, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Many. Now take your Bible and go. Let's go to the next thing here I want to show you um, before we close. Uh, we're looking at Acts chapter 20. Salvation is serious. I'm glad I got saved as a young kid. Brother, brother Chuck, I, I'm so glad I got saved when I was young. It saved me a lot of headache. If I had to grow up in the mess that these young people are having to grow up in now, I don't, I don't know if I'd have got saved. I just don't know. There's so much there. There's so much brainwashing that starts when they're little and it just indoctrinates them and indoctrinates them and indoctrinates them and, and they get up here to this age and it's just, and if mom and daddy are not at home counteracting that, your children are in trouble, folks. It's your responsibility as a parent to counteract this communist, socialist, wicked propaganda that the world is constantly trying to put into them. 
They are raising up a generation of people that hate God and hate everything that stands for God. Nothing bothers them. They see so much bloodshed on TV and murder that when the real thing happens, it don't even phase them. I watched a video one day of some kids and, and this guy pulled along there and was shooting people. And these kids were standing around and they were just like, they were just frozen. They just stood there like it. it, it there was no response. It's like they were in a trance. It's like they were watching a video game or a movie. I tell you what we'd have done when we were kids. <laughs> we'd have got out of there in a hurry. <laughs> it's the generation. It's the things that the devil is putting there to get your mind in a fixation to where the gospel cannot get in. That's the purpose of it all. That's why from morning to noon to evening to the time you go to bed, the devil's got something plugged in your ears, something plugged up in front of your eyes, so that it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're occupied to the point where the gospel cannot get to you. Amen. I got a TV. I know everybody in this room has one. I like movies. And a lot of you like movies. I like to watch stuff. I have a phone. But I'm going to tell you something. You hit it on the nail earlier, brother, when you said what you said about you got to make a conscious effort now. And yeah. that's the key. If you're saved, you tune in to the Holy Ghost that's inside of you and let Him lead you. When I get ready to read my Bible and stuff, I cut it all off. I want that junk here so I can focus here. Look at this in Acts chapter 20. I've got about five, ten minutes. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he's talking to the bishops, he's talking to the elders in the church. He says, well, let's go back a few verses. I want to go back a few verses. Let's go back over here. Um, let's see. Um, let's go back to verse 25. And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the, God, the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Isn't that interesting that Paul said that when he was out killing Christians? <laughs> <laughs> something changed there didn't it what changed the blood the blood washes away every sin including murder did you know in the Old Testament there was no sacrifice for murder there was two things in the Old Testament if you did your goose was cooked murder and adultery and you know what's interesting about that David committed murder and adultery and didn't die. He was a man after God's own heart. And he was called a man after God's own heart after the fact. Yeah. What's the difference? David's a type of the born-again Christian who's guilty of a lot of bad stuff, but the blood comes in and washes it all away to where you can say like Paul says, I am pure from the blood of all men. There's a second application here, though. Here's the second application. As a born-again Christian, you are a soul winner. You tell everybody you come in contact with about Jesus Christ. Paul did. Maybe that's why he said what he said. Every person he came in contact with, he shared the gospel with them, whether they wanted to hear it or not. And then at the end of this conversation, he said, I am pure from the blood of all men. I've told them. 
Now, can we say that as Christians? Can you say that? How many times you've been in the grocery store or been at the teller window and God prompted you to say something or give a gospel track and you refused to do so because you 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 got nervous or you got you know you held your head down well they might think I'm crazy they think you're crazy anyway I don't care I don't care who you are if you're saved they think you're crazy so why not just give them something to talk about <laughs> you might be surprised at what the response might be. I was in school one time and I was in the library and I was studying my Bible and this young lady walked into the school. It was in high school. I was in the, it's a long time ago, 10th grade, I think it was, maybe the 11th. This young lady came walking in and she sat across from me. I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm praying and reading my Bible during study hall. And the Lord prompted me in my spirit to go talk to her. <laughs> what in the world am I going to say to this young lady? I told you to go talk to her. And it was heavy. You ever been like that where it's real heavy and the Lord tells you to do something? And it's like, whoo, man, it's heavy. I can't get out of this. And I just kept giving excuse after excuse. Of, man, she's going to think I'm crazy. She's going to think I'm a wacko. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I don't want to deal with this right now. And my hands are sweating and my, you know, I'm just getting nervous. And, and finally I gave in to the Lord as the bell was ringing. <laughs> I went up to her. And as, as soon as I began to talk, the Lord gave me the words. I said, I don't know who you are. But God told me in my spirit to come and let you know everything is going to be okay. God has heard you and your prayers. And he is going to help you get through this. Whatever it is. This young lady started crying. She says, you do not know how much that meant to me that you said what you just said. The next day I come to study hall and I sat down and I'm reading my Bible and this same young lady, she comes in and she hands me a letter. I still got it in my library. And she proceeds to tell me as a 16-year-old girl, she was out on a date as teenagers often are and she got in a compromising situation and she wound up pregnant. And she had an abortion. And she was on her way out the day before to commit suicide. She had asked God to forgive her, but somehow in her spirit, she just didn't feel like God would love her anymore because she was so damaged. And she was on her way out to end it all, to get rid of the pain that she was feeling. And God sent his word to her through an obedient servant that would say, God has heard you. He will heal you. He will restore you. The blood of Jesus Christ is so powerful that yes, it can even forgive the most heinous act that you have committed against him. If you only but call upon him, he will heal you. This young lady was restored, given new purpose in life, and now after that time, she graduated, she became a young mother and became prom a prominent, strong believer in the Word of God and has a family now and has children now. God blessed that situation, whereas if I had not been obedient to what God had told me to do, she would have ended her life that day. God is real. Now, 
You've heard me say many times here, you know, you got to be careful about people saying, the Lord told me. I agree with that. But there are times, Christian, where God will put in your spirit to say something to somebody, and you better be obedient, but know who it is. Make sure you're on scriptural grounds when you do it. And God will bless that. Paul says here, I am pure from the blood of all men. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I've told you everything that God has given to me. That's a good preacher. Verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So yes, it is scriptural, dry cleaners, to tell people this is my flock in this local assembly. You got these hyper dispensationalists that say, well, it's not scriptural for a preacher to say that that's his flock. Yes, it is, actually. The Bible says that he's given the flock for you to be yeah, an overseer of them. What does that mean? You're a shepherd. A preacher is a shepherd. Mm -hmm. If he's not, he's a hireling. Mm -hmm. He's one of the two. Take your pick. <laughs> the Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. That's your job. Which he's purchased with what? His own blood. The blood of Jesus Christ is the blood of God Almighty. Therefore it is pure. Therefore it is undefiled. Therefore it is spotless. Therefore when whatever it touches becomes clean. I don't care how dirty it is. It's better than Mr. Clean. It'll take away every stain. It'll take away every blemish. It'll take away everything. I don't care what people say about you and your previous lifestyle. And I am one to tell people right now, I have a testimony. I have a past. I have things that I have done in my past that I am not proud of. But I am here to tell you, the blood of Jesus Christ can take all of that and wipe it clean so that I can stand before you today and I can talk about my past and I can talk about it not in the shame but in, uh, in amazement that what God took over here that was broken and defiled and messed up, He brought it over here and made it clean and spotless and pure and blameless and can be used of God despite what was over here. That's Jesus Christ. I ran with the worst of the worst. I used to fly out to Hollywood, California, and do all kinds of wicked things out there. And I can tell you now that God has taken a lot of those same kind of people that I was involved with and brought them into the ministry of Jesus Christ and is using those same people that people in church hold their nose up and look down on and say, well, God doesn't use those kind of people. You are a liar. God will use anybody that submits to Him and is broken before Him. He took a murderer and made him a saint. We pick and choose what we think God can use. God can use anybody that yields to Him. And when the blood of Jesus touches a whoremonger, a prostitute, a homosexual, a pornographer, it doesn't matter what they are and what they've done, they become on the same playing field in the eyes of God and God can take those people and bring something good out of it. I know. I used to be one. I stand before you today not because I'm worthy to stand in this pulpit, but because of what God did for me in this pulpit. I'm clean today because the blood of Jesus Christ made me clean. Not because I was born a Christian. I grew up in a hell hole. I grew up in a drug infested home where you didn't hear the name of God unless it was used in a profanity statement. And that was quite frequent. <laughs> and by the grace of God, 
I had a little aunt named Sally Dale, and she decided to come over to our house, and she wanted to bring me to a Sunday school meeting one day in Kenansville, North Carolina, and I went to that church, and that preacher preached the hell out of me. <laughs> That's what he did. By the time he got done with that sermon, Brother Earl, I was ready to get in the altar because I was afraid if he didn't shut up, I was going to die and go to hell right before the service. <laughs> Amen. When you look at this preacher today, don't look at me as some highfalutin guy. I'm not. I'm not but I, when I go to the prisons, I tell those inmates in there, I say, let me tell you something, gentlemen. Let me tell you something right now. You see this collar? And they say, yeah, yeah, you're a preacher. Yeah, I'm a bishop. I'm a preacher. Okay, that's fine. But let me tell you something. There's only one thing that makes me different than you. And they say, what is that, preacher? I said, you got caught and I didn't. Yeah. Because I've done some things that if I'd have got caught, I'd be in prison right now. Yeah. Right now. The difference is God's grace was on me and mercy was with me. And God had a purpose and he wanted to use me. So he gave me that grace to be able to get past that. And I tell those men in prison, I said, this is not the end of your life. Some of you are more free in here than some Christian people so-called in churches sitting in pews. If you're saved, you can rejoice and know that no matter what kind of bars is around you, you are going up when the Lord Jesus Christ calls your name. Amen. What's, what makes the difference? The blood. It's God's blood. Paul warns us after his departure, verse 29, these grievous wolves will enter in not sparing the flock. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, drawing away disciples of them. Brother, oh, we talked about that this morning before church. How did in the early church these things begin to creep in? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Paul tells us to watch and to remember. Interesting, he says remember. Isn't that what Jesus said at the Last Supper? He says, do this in remembrance of me. So Paul might be making an allusion there, not just to the scriptures, but also to the thing that is supposed to help us bring remembrance to our minds about Jesus Christ. He says, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to want every one of you night and day with tears. Do you weep? How many Christians weep anymore over their loved ones? Lost. Yeah, I got some family that's lost, brother. I just... Something got a hold of you, man. You become callous. There used to be a time in churches we had altars. We're gonna have one in this one eventually. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a thing here where there used to be the mourners bench. Remember the mourners bench? Mm -hmm. Used to be the mourners bench where the deacons would come over and they'd pray down over there at the uh, mourner's bench and when they get up, man, that thing would be so soaking wet with tears. The altars would be full of tears. They had to change it from carpet. They didn't have carpet back then. It was just wooden. So the tear stains would be all over the altars. We got fancy now. We got carpet. So you don't see the tears. So people stop crying. we become too sophisticated for crying. Mm -hmm. But they're still going to hell. Mm -hmm. Nothing's changed. <clears throat> Your loved ones are going to hell. Does that bother you? Yep. I got a... I got a daughter. She's going to hell. If something don't change. She's out there prostituting herself, drugging it up. But you know what? She'll call me every week. 
She'll say, I love you, Daddy. And I'm so sorry for what I am. Mm. I said, sweetheart, your daddy loves you. He prays for you. He weeps for you. I want you to change, but only you can change. Mm -hmm. And God's grace and mercy is with you. Do we weep? Do we cry? I wonder. Do we get in our altars at home? Do you have an altar at home that you pray in? Does your family see you pray? Does your children see you pray? Because see, it's not do as I say, it's gonna work. That's, that, that, that doesn't work. They got to see you do it. They got to see you on your knees. They got to see you praying over that food. They got to see you praying for them when they're going to school. I've got it instilled in my little man back there uh, that's running around. Uh, when we get ready to go to school and, and, and we take him to school, when we get in that car and we head to school, he grabs my hand, he's ready to pray. I'm praying for his day. I'm praying for God to protect him. You know why? There's wolves out there. And they go in schools. And they kill our kids. And they shoot them down. There's wolves out there, Brother Earl, in the classrooms that are indoctrinating our kids to hate God and be a, become atheists and become sex perverts. Are you praying for them? We should... I plead the blood of Jesus over them. Preacher, you got to pray for your congregation. I do. I pray for everybody in this church. Those that are here and when you don't come, I pray for you too. I call you by name. When you tell me something on this list here, I take it serious. When I'm at work, I keep one folded up in my pocket. And when I'm doing my rounds and I'm outside walking around, I'm praying. I'm praying for the needs. God help uh, whoever, so and so, help them with their kids, help them with their finances, help them with their, their struggles, help them with their weaknesses. Help them, Lord. God help them. Help them to get a hold of what they need to get a hold of. Help them to see things like you've showed it to me, Lord, and help them to see the Word of God like they should. Help them. Amen. Let's pray to the Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, today for your blessings. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, Lord, that is extended and renewed for us every day. We thank you for the blood covenant of Jesus Christ. It's through the blood that we have access to the throne of grace. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ that we have the ability to be able to read the Word of God and understand it. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ that we wake up and we go to bed and have an understanding and have a conscious understanding to know that you are there and that you're in our hearts. We didn't know that before we were saved. We know it now. As we close this part of the service today, Lord, we ask God that you will keep us safe and keep us preserved until we come together again. We pray for our loved ones that are outside the ark of safety, God. Save them, Lord. Do whatever it takes. Bring conviction. Help us to be that Bible they need to read in our lifestyle and in our conversations. Help us not to be cruel, but help us to share that love and compassion of Jesus Christ with them and be like the Good Samaritan and pour in the oil and the wine into the wounds of the one that was thrown into the ditch. Help us to bring that healing balm of Gilead to that lost person that needs so desperately to have it. Give us that burden for lost people again, Lord, that prompts us to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. 
not in a embarrassing way, not in a shameful way, but with with uh, the understanding and joyfulness that you put in our hearts when you saved us. It's a privilege, it's an honor to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. You did so much for us and we thank you for it. We give you praise and we give you honor and we give you glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.